Good morning and welcome to our worship service today. I'm glad to be here and I'm sure uh, you are glad to join together with all God's saints, virtually, even from your home, to worship our good God. And I hope as you've uh, gathered to worship the Lord, uh, that you've come with a sense of expectation, a sense to be encouraged, a sense of expectation to be refreshed and even challenged as we approach our good and great Heavenly Father. I encourage you today then, as we turn our hearts to God, to participate wholeheartedly, to pray along with the prayers, to sing along with the singing, and to open your hearts to God's word as it is uh, preached to us today. Now, our circumstances have has definitely changed over the past few months, and no doubt uh, our circumstances will continue to change in the future. Uh, but one truth remains the same, and that is our God is king, and he rules and reigns from heaven. I'm going to read Psalm 93 to help us turn our hearts to the Lord. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. So I invite you to turn your hearts to the Lord as we sing together our first hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. We worship you today, our great God, because you reign, uh, you rule, you are the sovereign king of heaven and earth. As the psalm reminds us, the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. And so we praise you, Lord, that you are the king eternal whose rule can never be threatened. We praise you because you are the king, uh, not of our own choosing. We did not get to crown you, but you reign from all eternity. We praise you that you are the perfect king, whose words and decrees can never be shaken. Our great king and lord, we are grateful this morning that we can approach you as our father. You are the mighty transcendent God who lives in holiness. And we are the weak, sinful creatures who cannot approach you by our own merit. But such is the greatness, the, the magnitude of your grace, that you have covered the expansive gap between your holiness and our sin by sending your Son, Christ Jesus, to die and to take on the punishment of our sins. We give you praise that Christ was resurrected from the grave to give us new life. And so we approach you through the name of your Son, our Savior and our King. Father, as we approach you today, we are aware of our failings, our failings to acknowledge your rule and kingship over our life. Uh, the psalm reminds us that your, statute, your statutes, your, your promises and laws stand firm. But we confess, Father, that we do not trust you completely, even though your word stands so firm and true. So often when we encounter the challenges in our lives, we look to the world around us for answers, rather than trusting in your promises. We confess, Lord, that at times we use the strategies, the therapies, and the solutions of our broader society to deal with deeper spiritual problems rather than trusting in your sure word and your firm rule. Please forgive us for wanting the benefits of living in a kingdom uh, that's good and blessed, a kingdom of yours, but uh, forgive us for not wanting you to have your kingship and rule over our lives. We confess that at times you are not king. You are not king of the, over the details of our lives. You are not king at times over our wallets. We confess that you are not always king over our tongues. And with shame, we also confess that at times you are not always king over our hearts and minds. Please forgive us for our sin today as we turn to you. By your spirit, good and gracious Lord, give us true repentance Turn our will and affections towards you. Lord, you are kind and gracious, and we need you to conform us into the image of your Son. Lord, as we approach you today, we are grateful that you have promised forgiveness to us because of Christ alone. We approach you knowing that you are a good and a gracious Father who cares for us immensely. And so, Lord, we approach you today also, confessing that our hearts are heavy, heavy with worry and grief and anxiety and sadness. And so we ask you to move among us by your Spirit as we worship you together, even in our homes. We know that you hear us, for we have asked all these things in the strong and powerful name of your Son and our Saviour and King, Christ Jesus. Amen. Reading from the Bible, Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verses 14 to 20. The King, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the other nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must free from among your own brothers. 
do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire a great number of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the priests who are Levites. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that may, he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. Yeah. 
Today's Bible reading comes from 1 Samuel 8. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as the king, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day. Forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who are asking him for a king. He said, This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others will to plough his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When the day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations, with the king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, Everyone go back to your own town. Thanks, Glenn, for leading, uh, and and Amy for the songs, and also uh, to Catherine and Ray for reading the Bible for us. Um, it's great to be here to preach um, and hope you guys uh, really get something from today's word. Uh, let's pray as we come before God. Father, we thank you as uh, we gather, although we are online, uh, we are united uh, in your Son, Jesus Christ, and we are also united by the Spirit that dwells in us as well. As we come before your word, would, uh, would we not just listen, but would we truly hear? Uh, would we not just look, but would we truly see? And would you work the miracle uh, of life and of truth uh, and of faith in us today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, you might or you might not know, uh, recently, somewhat recently, there was a uh, kerfuffle online, uh, on the online world around uh, changing fashion trends. Gen Z took to social media to express their uh, disgust, in a way, at millennials and their outdated fashion. And, of course, the irony of that disgust is that the fashion trend of Gen Z uh, is essentially vintage or retro. So they are taking fashion that was uh, out of date and bringing it back. You know, each generation always thinks uh, they're better than the one before. Uh, but just as fashion repeats itself, so does human history often repeat itself. Um, 
And and the case in and case in point is Israel in today's story. We're only one generation uh, forward from the story of the ark. Uh, in the story of the ark, Samuel was a young boy. Now he is old, and as Samuel grows old and as Samuel grew old, Israel grew nervous. Uh, they grew nervous because things had been really good under Samuel's leadership. Uh, but as Samuel was getting old, they were worried because they wanted to secure for themselves safety and security in the days to come. Now, we all have questions that have to do with security, don't we? Uh, security of our assets, security of our health, uh, the security of life for our children. What will happen to our kids if we're not there? Or maybe what will happen to us if our kids are not there? And uh, many times and uh, many people uh, spend their lives preoccupied with trying to figure out uh, what they need to gain and obtain and keep to have security over their lives. So the story today tells us about our tragic tendency to want to be like the world in our search for security and our rejection of God as king as we do so. So I've broken the story today up into four sections and uh, hopefully we'll see how each section helps us understand the lessons that God wants us to learn today. And uh, you might be thinking, well, four, uh, usually we have three. Uh, I'll try my best to not uh, go too much over time. Um, but, you know, uh, the good thing about being online is uh, if you do fall asleep, you're not falling asleep on the hard pews. You'll be comfortable at home. Now, as I just mentioned, many years have passed and um, many good years have passed under Samuel's leadership. And now Israel's future is under threat. Uh, and one is because Samuel's old and he, he has one foot out the door. Um, he's, he's soon to be gone. And on the other hand, his sons are unlike their father. His sons are leaders who seek personal gain and pervert justice. They took bribes. And, uh, and so the elders of Israel, they're, they're worried. They, they see that Samuel's nearly gone and Samuel's succession plan uh, is really uh, not going to work. So they come to Samuel and they come with a solution. They say to him in verse 5, Samuel, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. So Samuel is old and his sons aren't going to do a good job. There needs to be some change. Uh, maybe a king might help. And of course, the first thing we recognize is um, it's strange that they do ask for a king because considering the, the history um, of sons in leadership in Israel, uh, it doesn't seem like a great idea to appoint a dynasty of kingship uh, where you have uh, perpetually have sons in leadership. Uh, but that doesn't seem too important to them. Um, because, and it shouldn't really be too important to us because the, what's really the issue here uh, as we read, is it's not that they're asking for a king. Asking for a king isn't really the issue. And that's why uh, we, when, we, when we read Deuteronomy 17, which comes before the book of Samuel, um, and that was written by Moses, there actually was a provision for Israel to ask for a king. Um, so we're meant to see that a human king, so that them asking for a king is no worse than uh, them having a human uh, judge or a human priesthood leading them. So what is at uh, issue? What is the problem with this request? Well, the issue is what is at the heart of the request, isn't it? And the issue at the heart of the request is found in that key phrase, 
Israel wanted a king such as all the other nations have. The people of Israel are looking around. They're looking around at the world and and they're saying, you know, uh, if we had what they had, uh, if we're going to be successful and prosperous as a people, if we had what they had, then we would be. We need to be like them. They wanted to be like the world around them. In other words, they wanted to be worldly rather than holy. The people of God, Israel, were called to be a holy people, a people set apart for God. But in this case, as they seek after security, Uh, And as they think and as they look around, they want what everyone else has, what the world has. Now the church today is not immune to this too. And the great temptation of the church will always be to be like the world around us. Uh, There's no better way for Satan to hinder the witness of the church than by making the church indistinguishable from the world. Now, one of the greatest health risks to young people today is mental health, isn't it? And, um, and particularly for young people living in the 21st century, a lot of those mental health issues come uh, and arise out of self-esteem issues and body image problems. And it's greatly exacerbated by the influence of the world around them. Media, social media, you know, TV, uh, advertisements, movies, all of the, these things, the world tells them that everyone should look like this and, and be like this and wear this. And it defines beauty and worth and a good life for them in a very specific way. And for us to solve that problem, uh, Well, the solution is not going to be us indulging and chasing after all of those worldly requirements, but the solution is always to address that question of worth and identity and ground worth and identity in God uh, and in God's love rather than the affirmation and the love uh, that we are promised based on what size clothing we wear or what brand we wear, or how many followers we have on social media. And all of us, whether young or old, whether we care about uh, fashion and and waist sizes or followers on social media or not, all of us are to some degree followers of the trends of our day. We look around the world and we say, I want that. I like that. I like how they do things over there. Uh, And I'd rather it that way than God's way. And that's what's going on with Israel's request here. But we have to recognize that this request uh, is more than just a bit of uh, uh, foolishness. It's actually a rejection of God, and that's our second point. When the elders of Israel bring their request to Samuel, Samuel knows that it's an evil request. Um, and at first, it also seems like Samuel takes it a little bit personally. Maybe, maybe they're unhappy with how Samuel handled his children. Uh, maybe he shouldn't have put them in leadership. Um, maybe now that Samuel's getting old, you know, the, uh, people are, the complaints are coming out of the woodwork. People are starting to grumble. So what does Samuel do? Well, first, Samuel goes to pray to God, doesn't he? And the Lord says to him in verse 7, The Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now there's something very encouraging and also something very confronting in that. Uh, It's encouraging because in some way, God is telling Samuel, uh, look, Samuel, you've done what you needed to do. Uh, You haven't done a bad job. 
uh, it's okay. It's not you. Uh, when things change or when people want to move on, it doesn't necessarily mean we've done a bad job. And uh, in Samuel's case, that's true. And it's true for us too. Uh, whenever we are living faithfully as God's ambassadors, living as God's ambassadors uh, means that we will be rejected. And when we are rejected, and, and as we are rejected, uh, when we're seeking to honor Jesus and let him be made to know, known to people, God tells us it's not us that's being rejected. It's really God. And when we suffer with rejection, we can often be very disheartened and discouraged and maybe even get insecure. But God says, don't be disheartened. It's not you they've rejected, it's me. And um, there's also another lesson here that when we are disheartened, uh, we're often tempted. The first thing to do when we're disheartened or discouraged or, or we have a complaint to make um, um, is we like to either wallow in our disappointment or we like to tell everybody how disappointed we are. Uh, I know I like to do both those things, but it's a challenge to be uh, like Samuel in this case where when he hears this request from the elders of Israel and he feels disheartened and he, and he feels disappointed, he goes straight to God before he does anything else. But, and the confronting part of this, of course, is uh, the sin at the heart of Israel's request. And uh, it confronts the sin at the heart of each and every one of us uh, and of our country and of the whole world, which is the rejection of God as king and replacing him with something else. Now, for Israel to say, we want to be like the other nations, uh, is, is essentially them saying, we don't want to be your people, God. We don't want to have to serve you as our God. We'd rather have something else. And God says, look, this isn't even the first time they've done this. They've done this ever since Egypt, ever since I rescued them from slavery in Egypt. They've left me over and over again to serve other gods. You know, it's tempting to listen to this as a story about the Israelites uh, in 1000 BC, and, and, and we can label them as stubborn and stupid people. Uh, how could they forget so quickly? Um, but we have to remember that the story of Israel has always been our story. Uh, the story of Exodus as Israel is freed from slavery and the blood of a lamb is painted uh, on their doorposts is our story. As we are freed from the bondage of slavery to sin by the blood of the lamb. So the Bible here is making a really, really uh, telling comment and, and confronting us uh, on our own potential to replace God and reject God as king in our lives and worship other things and serve other things and place other things as king. It's warning us of our need to be careful uh, and to reflect on who we really are serving as king day after day. Uh, John Calvin said a human heart is a perpetual fa factory of idols. So we need to recognize the idols, the idolatry in our hearts and in our lives. Are we trusting in something that the world says will give us the security that we want? Like the Israelites, if we have a king like the other nations, maybe he'll go out and fight our battles for us. You know, think about this in the coming week. Uh, look around you at your workplace or in your families or uh, in, in, the, in the spheres of life that God has placed you. What are the kings of our world? What are the kings of uh, Sydney? What are the kings that the people around you serve? What are they chasing after and putting their 
trust and hope in. Hope in. And then ask yourself, is their king no different to mine? And if it isn't, then maybe we need to carefully consider whether we really are actually living to be like the other nations and have rejected God as our king ourselves too. You know, it might not be normal these days to spend Sunday mornings at church or watching church. It might not be normal in your workplace to not gossip about your co-worker or your boss. It might not be normal to be willing to lose for someone else's gain. It might not be normal to uh, not prioritize wealth and health and comfort and material things as our source of security. But Christians are people called to be holy and obedient to God, following his word, even if that is different to what is fashionable or normal to the world around us, and even when it seems uncomfortable and risky and insecure in that moment to us. Now, and there's a good reason why God does that. Um, God tells Samuel, and this is interesting, because God tells Samuel to listen to Israel uh, and, and, and essentially give them what they want, but also to give them a warning. So he says, listen to Israel, but also give them a warning. And I want to touch upon the reason why God allows Israel to get their way. Um, as well as the reason why God wants us to serve him as king rather than something else. Um, In verse 10 onwards, uh, Samuel goes and he gives this warning to the people of Israel. He says, Samuel told uh, all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plough his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. And when that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. So first, the reason why God wants us to serve him as king is, as we read, uh, having a king like the nations is not very pleasant. Uh, It would not be like the king of Deuteronomy 17 that we read. The king of Deuteronomy 17 was a, is a king uh, that loves God's word. He wasn't interested. He's not interested in taking uh, many wives for himself. He's not interested in amassing his own wealth or exploiting the people for his gain. But this king, like the other nations, Samuel says, this king will take, he'll take your sons to fight his own battles. He'll take your daughters to f- and he'll fill his belly with your harvest and, and um, your servants, your livestock. And, and if we look at verse 17, uh, he won't be satisfied with taking your stuff. And eventually he'll take you, yourself, as his slaves as well. Almost the, pretty much the definition of a tyrant. Abusing his power. You know, being free from God's rule seems to Israel like a beautiful freedom. But it, what it really is, is an ugly slavery to the tyranny 
of sinfulness. Now, we think it's okay to unleash our anger just one time. We think it's, uh, we, we just need to satisf- satisfy that sexual desire just one time and it will be done. We think we just need one more promotion, one more zero in our bank statement. How often do we tell ourselves just one more thing or one more time? And those things might be good for a moment. But it leaves you emptier than before. So you keep going and going and going. And before you know it, you are its slave. You know, if you think marriage is what will make you happy, then being single will be the worst thing uh, to ever happen to you. And if your marriage... Uh, turns out to not uh, be what you wanted it to be, then you are perpetually, uh, you're doomed to perpetually live in temptation to leave the marriage you're in or to have an affair. If success is your king, then it will undoubtedly lead to overwork, it will lead to jealousy resentment when things don't go your way or when others seem to be doing better than you are. This applies to everything. When we have something else as king in our lives, it enslaves us. Money, alcohol, uh, you know, drugs, even just fun things, hobbies, uh, computer games, golf, All of these things can, they they don't have to start off as bad things. They they start off as good things. But if you indulge it more and more and more until you begin to crave it and you base your happiness in it, then we know that it has already enslaved us. And the ultimate judgment that God says, that God gives, is that we really might get, like Israel, we really might get what we ask for. You know, the reason that God allows Israel to take a human king and, and he listens to their request or he allows them to have their way is his judgment. God leaves us to replace him with something else. And it makes me think of Romans chapter 1. If you haven't read Romans chapter 1 or you've forgotten what it says, you you might want to have a read later on. I'll just quickly read. Uh, It says this, God, uh, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. That God gives them over to the desires of their hearts. And Samuel says, you know, when that day comes and you get your king and you get what you ask for, you, you realize that you're enslaved to that. And, and he's a tyrant and you'll cry out for relief. But God will not answer you. And that's the dangerous possibility of what will happen when we allow ourselves or, uh, to reject God or slip away from God. And, and that might be you now or it might be someone that you know. Uh, slipping away from God, rejecting God in their lives. But if, and if it is you, then don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until uh, it's too late to cry out to God and, and he doesn't listen. Turn back to God and serve him as king today. Let me move to this last point. Because there is uh, redemption, there is good news in this story. Um, you know, for us as humans, there's a limit to how much rejection we can take. Um, uh, there's, there's a limit to how much heartbreak we can have from a one-sided love. 
Uh, imagine as parents your love for your child um, and, and this child wants nothing to do with you or he constantly rejects you and rebuffs you, uh, avoids you and curses you. Now how heavy would that be uh, as a burden for a parent? Or imagine the sorrow of a man or a woman who loves their spouse or partner dearly, but uh, their eyes and their heart always seems to be elsewhere with someone else. And that's where we are given a really profound insight into the beauty of God's love for sinners. God is rejected by Israel, but that does not lead to God's complete rejection of Israel either. God loves Israel even though they constantly leave him for idols and for other kings. And we're going to see that although Israel rejects God by asking for a king like everyone else, God provides for them and God provides for us a king that is unlike everyone else. Uh, and we see a glimpse of that in, in King David. Uh, king David was a, uh, uh, was a king after God's own heart, but uh, every human king fails. Um, and God provides this king who is so different, so different to the king like the other nations, so different to the king... Uh, that Samuel describes in his warning to Israel. Let me read uh, f- to you from Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." You'll notice the difference between the sort of king that Samuel describes uh, and the sort of king Jesus is. One takes and takes and takes and claims things as his right. But one gave up his rights and humbled himself even to the point of death for his people. Now why did Jesus do that? Jesus did that because He's the, God, he's the king of God's own choosing. Jesus did that because he's the king who loves God's word and who, who longs after God's own heart. He's the king that isn't interested in exploitation because his kingdom is not of this earth. Christ's kingdom is not measured uh, in the same way that worldly kingdoms and, uh, are measured. He's a king who lays down his life for sinners like you and me. He had had no earthly palace. He had no security. He had no place to lay his head. And he died the death reserved for the worst of criminals. And he was stripped of his clothes. And he died as people mocked him. And that's the king that we can love. That's the king that we can worship as the king who God has given to us. Because the king of kings humbled himself and bore our sins for our freedom and for our security. And he's been raised to the highest place. So if we're looking for security in the kings of uh, the world, to be like the other nations then we're putting our trust in the wrong king. We need to put our trust in the king who has authority to judge all the earth. A king that isn't interested in enslaving us and taking and taking and taking, but rather 
Here is a king who served us first, who loved us, even while we hated him. The kings of this world demand our allegiance and our attention, but he can never give us the security. He can never give us the hope and the fullness of life that Jesus can. Israel looked for that in a human king. But we are to look not to any earthly thing or a human king like all the other nations, but to the servant king. To the servant king who lowers himself and has been exalted to the highest place. And we are invited to worship him and adore him and serve him and trust him today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Jesus and that through Jesus we see what it really is to be a true king, a king who loves, a king of, uh, who upholds your word, a king who is just. And we know the day is coming when uh, your mercy uh, will end and uh, we will all have to stand before you and uh, give an account of who we served and what we served as king in our lives. And Father, we, Father, we ask that your spirit would uh, turn our hearts to you, that we would learn from the lesson of uh, the Israelites today. And if we have been looking for a king like the other nations, May we repent and turn back to you and worship you and adore you and find fullness of life and fullness of security in you alone. In your name we pray. Amen.
We have been reminded today that we do not worship a king like the other nations. We don't worship a king who takes and takes and takes, but a king who gives and gives and gives. Uh, so I encourage you to meditate on our gracious, good and kind king in the coming week. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Yeah.